this this uh, webinar is about emigration research, and it's from Ireland Shores, uh, is what it's entitled. And it just is um, some tips and tricks and some information about researching your ancestors um, uh, from Ireland, okay? Um, emigration is a process that affects every single family in Ireland. It is the one of the, the few things that every family has been affected by, whether you're a landlord, a tenant, um, the destitute, or the very well-off um, in society uh, at some stage or some point in time in Ireland. Every single family has been affected by emigration. And as a result of that, we have a diaspora or people that can claim Irish heritage of, of at least 70 million people. Um, and we see that when we have visitors from New Zealand and Peru and Canada and America and all over. So how do we find out where our ancestors went? And I'm gonna talk about, um, based on uh, country, but look at some of the different sources that we can use. Now, before I get started, there's two types of migration that I think is very important for people to note. And there's what's known as step migration and there's chain migration. Now, step migration is um, a type of migration where somebody will emigrate to a particular place for a temporary period of time. Um, or a short period of time with the intention of emigrating further. You see a lot of this to, with people that went to England, for example, with the intention of eventually making their way to Canada or making their way to Australia or to other places. And one of the reasons why you have step migration is financial. It was cheaper to go to England than it was to go um, to get passage to America or to Canada. Um, it was cheaper to get passage to Canada uh, than it was to get it into the US or into Australia. So step migration is something very important to keep in mind that people, and it's essentially it means that people migrate multiple times um, in steps from Ireland to UK, UK to Australia or other countries or, or even UK, Australia, Australia to America. So that's the first thing. The second thing is chain migration. Now, chain migration is where groups of individuals for a, from a particular family or a particular um, place in Ireland emigrate either en masse to a particular place, either in Australia or Canada or America, or there is a, a consistent migration for family members or people from a particular place to another area over a period of time. So several people go over first, establish themselves, and they send for other people. And whole communities actually migrated from parts, specific areas of Ireland to specific areas of Canada or the US or Australia. And this is where we get the names, the, the Irish sounding names in other places and other countries. You get Clare Valley in Australia. You get Little Wexford in Iowa. You get Cork Town in Detroit. Um, somebody said there was a place called Wexford in Pennsylvania. So that would have, um, you know, a, a Irish roots, or there was there was some reason for for that name. So those are two two types of migration to keep in mind when you're researching your ancestors. Did they go step by step to various places before they made a permanent settlement, or did they go as a group? Okay. So we'll move along. And as I said, some of the sources for research: ships lists, passenger lists bounty or convict lists, this would apply to Australians, um, and assisted emigration schemes. And that applies to a number of countries, okay? Not just uh, mostly Australia, but not um, you know, exclusively Australia. So emigration, online, or rather, sorry, online free sources, just to get started. And as I said, you don't need to be furiously writing you will get a list of all these sources um, after the webinar is over. The ships list. The ships list is a website that is essentially run by volunteer transcribers 
who have gone to the trouble of, of transcribing ships lists, passenger lists, newspaper clips or reports about ship arrivals, um, shipwrecks, um, shipwrecks with lists of people that died on that shipwreck, and, and other documents having to do with um, ships coming into um, particular areas. And it's updated. Um, because it's an active group of people. Um, they, they're always looking, I think, for new people to do the transcription work. A lot of this work would have been done from microfilm, um, LDS film microfilms, or from um, other sources in libraries around the world. Uh, they, the ships list covers ships to the US, to Canada, to Australia. Um, it, it's a large database, um, lots of, um, lots of um, lists to look through. And it's a really good site to keep referring back to because, as I said, it's updating you. What you may not find today, you may find next month. Um, very, very good site and a good site to have um, in your in your back pocket, so to speak. Now, the other one of the other free websites is the Dun Brody Famine Ship Experience and Museum, and this is a museum that is located in County Wexford in Ireland. And they actually have a nice Irish emigration database on their website. It's one of those that the database is probably um, taken from various other lists. So it's not exclusive to them, but it is a nice, it's, it's nicely laid out and it's worth checking um, because you would get, uh, you would get names uh, another thing to mention about these databases or these lists are that they are transcribed lists, which means that they can have errors in them. So sometimes it's nice to look at multiple sources just to be sure that the spelling or the name is actually correct or the age is correct or, you know, whatever other information is contained. So the ship's lift and dunbrody.com. Um, now, further resources are familysearch.org, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. That's a free website. It's connected with the LDS Church. Um, it's, it's a very large website. It can be difficult to go through because it's not, um, it, it is user friendly, but a lot of the, the records aren't indexed. They're just up there. So you have to trawl through them. I think a good way of using that website is looking, go in, you know, press search and the little map will come up on the right hand side of the screen and you click on the area that you want to search, whether it's Australia or Canada or the US. And then there's further drop down lists that the, for the US, it's states, for Canada, it's provinces and for Australia, it's um, I think it is provinces as well for Australia. So that that has a lot of good resources and that has resources from all over the world. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, the other site that I mentioned is the Steve Morse genealogy website. I don't know if people are familiar with that or not. I'm sure some people are, and maybe some people aren't. This is a really, really great website. And what's great about it is that Steve Morse um, is a well he is a genealogist um I, he started off i suppose as a hobby but he's an it guy and he has developed a really neat search form it's a one-step search form and you can search by name you can search by um location so where somebody emigrated from um the the form that is very particular or particularly good is the Ellis Island Gold form. Now the site is free, you don't have to pay for the site. Um, what he does do is he lists all the ship lists and the various documentation that he has, and he tells you whether or not they're free or subscription. And he not only includes the popular ports, such as New York and Boston, but he includes Baltimore and he includes New Orleans and he includes a lot of the a lot of the other ports of arrival. The only the only disadvantage to the Steve Morse website is he doesn't cover Australia, um, but it's it's a very very good site and it's well worth looking at. And I would encourage you even to if you have. Um, 
ancestors that went to America, even if you don't need to do a search on them, you, you know about them, the search is still really good. The search form is really good to go into um, because it, it just, he, he's done a great job with it. Um, anyway, I'm gonna move along. Uh, emigration to the USA, and I won't say a whole lot about it. I've talked about it a little bit. The Dunbrody.com website, that's U.S. emigration. Um, Steve Morse is U.S. emigration. That's Canada as well. And then the Ellis Island passenger um, lists, the Ellis Island website, which is covers the, um, the passenger list from 1892 to 1955. Now, the beauty of the Ellis Island site is that it's it's a free site and it shows you the original passenger um, list manifest. So while they are transcribed, you actually can go and look at those original lists for free. And that's really important. That is really, really good to do because those lists often give you a lot more information than a transcription will. Um, and if you use Ancestry for them, you'll know that. Uh, if you also use the Ellis Island site, because they'll tell you, the Ellis Island passenger ships uh, lists tell you the age, the occupation, where they were from, their father or mother's name, um, who they were going to, how much money they carried with them, um, the person that they were going to, was it a cousin or an aunt or a brother or a sister, um, physical characteristics about them, that's from about 1900, 1905. They start to give physical descriptions of the um, emigrants. And what's, what's really helpful to do with the Ellis Island passenger list is to look at the full list because often, and this is where we talk about chain migration, often you will find the same parish showing up right through that particular ship list. For example, the Teutonic that arrives, and I'm just looking at one or talking about one where my great granduncle came off of. The Teutonic, which arrived on the 19th of April in 1900 to New York, to Ellis Island, had three people from the same townland in just over the road here, all teenagers. They all knew each other. They were probably all related way back when. And, but like that, they traveled together. Different names, they traveled together. Now they weren't all going to the same place, but they, um, they got on the ship together, they stayed together and probably looked out for each other. And when they landed, I'm sure they checked in to make sure that, you know, so-and-so was going where or needed to get to where he or she was going. So that's where the passenger ship lists are really invaluable for that, um, that information. Now, Castle Garden is another site which is very good, and that covers 1820 to about 1890. Now, you don't get a lot of information on Castle Garden. You get the first name, the last name, and age, and, and often it's where they came from in Ireland is Ireland. But it is useful. Um, it is good. You do see family, um, family, uh, families that came over together, and you can track by the ship name, you know, if, if they did arrive together. So that's, that is a good website as well. What really happens, and I think this is the biggest, um, the biggest challenge with emigration is that emigration records don't get um, very specific until the late 1800s, really the 1900s, um, as, as a lot of records do. Um, they don't um, take in that much information. So I will continue on now to emigration to Canada. And what I will say about emigration to Canada is that the website that I highly recommend, and there's, there, there's a couple of them, um, Australia is another one that has a very good archival website. The Canadian Library is really a terrific website. Um, they've really improved it a lot. They, they recently, uh, I think in the last year, changed the site to Canadiana, which in, it's become a, a, larger, a larger site holding a lot more resources than just, um, you know, your um, a few genealogy sources and few local history sources. They really, they really cover, have a lot of really good information and they are always updating. And as a matter of fact, you'll see there on the slide, New Brunswick, recently had um, uh, updated records within the last two weeks. And I believe very good records, which you can, you can access through their, their main site, through the main page. So 
they're, they have passenger lists from 1865 to 1922 separately, and those are very good. Unfortunately for can Canadian immigration is, is difficult from the point of view that it was a British colony, so um, they didn't really keep great immigration records before 1865. And for, for that reason, it was easier to emigrate into which and cheaper. So a lot of people that maybe didn't have the, the funds or the passage for America um, would have gone through Canada and then went into America once they got into Canada. That's something to keep in mind. And that, again, is going back to step migration. Um, they do have gross eel records from 1832, um, which are very good, can be very useful because a lot of people came through there. And they do then, they do have a list or an index there of emigrants pre-1865. But like I said, the information would not be as good as it is post-1865. But yet, it's a very active website. They're adding information all the time and very, very good um, to be aware of for Canadian, um, Canadian emigration. And that, that is something that I would definitely bookmark if I was going and looking for a Canadian um, family. So I will move along. I'm just keeping an eye here on the tie. UK emigration. The last time I gave the webinar on general family history, I had a lady say to me, please tell us about UK emigration. I don't know anything about UK emigration. Now, unfortunately, emigration to the UK is um, it's a little bit more complicated or less complicated in the sense that no passenger lists exist. There aren't really any passenger lists at all for um, emigration between, Ire between Ireland and um, England because they were, the, they were sub British subjects. So there was no need for it. So ways around the emigration are to view the English census returns, okay? Now there's two links there. The first link has, um, you can view them for free, but you do have to pay, I believe pay for them if you wanna download them. The second one is a free link. Um, I'm not sure if all of them are free, but a number of them are free. And I mean, what you do is if you know, and I know, the let's say for example the 1851 census says they just came from ireland okay were they there in 1841 they weren't there in 1841 so you know they came between 1841 and 1851 they emigrated and then you can go back to ireland and search through the the other records it's just a way of getting around it trying to close the gap as to when they left ireland now the other thing that i want to mention about uk emigration which is um different to other emigration, um, other countries of emigration. And this is the difference between the UK workhouse system and the Irish workhouse system. In the UK, the workhouse system was only responsible for those people that were living within the union where the workhouse was located. So if you were an Irish person that migrated to the UK with your family for seasonal work or for, for work, period, you fell on hard times and you went to the workhouse in your, for, for example, Somerset Union Workhouse, they were not obliged to take you in and they didn't take you in. What they did is they repatriated you back to your country of origin or your county of origin, which was Mayo or Donegal or wherever. And there are lists associated with those Irish people that would have shown up in some of these workhouses and lists made of, of families being sent back. Now that can be very helpful. There are two sets of lists that I know of. One has to do with Dorset and the other one has to do with Lancashire. And they're also known as vagrant passes. Now I've given you Claire Santry, who's a terrific genealogy blogger, her link into that because she explains it well. And those lists, unfortunately, are only available on Ancestry, as far as I know. Um, but she does explain the process. And if you have a library, a public library that has an Ancestry account or a subscription, you can go in there and look for those lists um, or look 
for if you go into Ancestry and just type in vagrant passes, it should come up. And their Dorset has them and Lancashire has them. And they're very, very useful. I have found families on them for people doing, re, you know, researching for other people. So it is something to keep in mind. It's not something that, um, that was common um, in other places, but in England, they were not obliged to keep the Irish in workhouses and you were sent back. You were Mayo's problem or wherever you were a, um, a native from. Okay. And it, it was something that did happen often because a lot of Irish workers were migrant workers. They went for the seasonal harvest with the intention of coming back. Um, but some of them did fall on hard times or became ill. And um, if they arrived into an English workhouse, they were being sent home. So we'll keep moving along. Uh, emigration to Australia, like Canada, fantastic library and archival websites. This is the New South Wales website. Um, there's also a very good New Zealand website, which I will talk about. The New South Wales um, Australian Library website divides lists between assisted emigration bounty emigration and convict emigration. And that's really helpful. Now, assisted emigration was a scheme by the government and the government paid for passage um, to resettle people. And it was a way of populating Australia. They weren't necessarily convicts, okay? Um, but they were, we all know about the orphan girls emigrant schemes. And there would have been some schemes that would have dealt with people not in workhouses, but receiving um, outdoor relief. They weren't, uh, they weren't part of, well, they were part of the workhouse system, but outside living outside the workhouse system. It was a way of clearing some of those outdoor relief systems or lists because they were a burden on the union. So that's one thing, assisted emigration. Bounty emigration, they're free. They're not convicts, but they're, um, they're, their passage is paid by settlers in Australia who are looking to um, either, are looking for people with specific skills to um to work for them or to work on farms and these people when once their passage was paid by this settler they were obliged to work for them and part of their wages would have been to pay back the um the passage so that's bounty emigration and convict emigration is then when you were sent out to australia and of course you um you were transported for your seven uh, seven years um and then you got your certificate of freedom or you applied for it and that they have the the library of the archives has the um the convict list as well as that the national archives of ireland has an ireland australia transportation database list and that's something worth looking at you may find an ancestor there um you will find in that um each listing there will be a file number and if you are interested in obtaining that file you can write to the National Archives in Ireland you will have to pay for the scanning of that file but um, you can make those arrangements with them um, that may be something that is very um, very uh, much of interest to a lot of people because we have travel restrictions now and as well as that um, on the archives which is opening again um, I think they're opening on Monday, they are um, limiting, severely limiting the number of people that are able to attend and it's booking only now. And that's not just the National Archives, that's the National Library. So it's worth keeping that in mind. But there is a scanning service and um, like that, you can get into the convict um, and you can get a convict file, make note of it and write to them for um, to try and get that um, get that sent to you. So, um, emigrant schemes. I'm just going to mention a couple of these quickly. The Peter Robinson emigrant scheme was a scheme for families from the North Cork area in the early 1920s to go to Canada. And it was assistance. Um, groups of families made the decision to move and their passage was paid for and they were, um, you know, they, they arrived. I don't remember whereabouts in Canada they went to, but that scheme is having a 200th year anniversary coming up in 2023, Bowley Howra is very actively looking for descendants of the Peter Robinson settlers 
Um, and we will have information on the website about that because there will be commemorations and publications and that sort of thing. And it's Olive Tree Genealogy has some of those lists. Um, they're the, the one that I know of for the moment, but like I said, there will be other places that will have lists because there is a commemoration coming up. Uh, the Talbot Emigrant Scheme is another scheme that was North Tipperary, Parts of Clare. That was Protestant farmers who um, had lands um, that uh, were farmed lands or were tenants of lands of um, the Earl of Talbot. And he got a large plot of land as a result of service um, in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, he fell on hard times. He decided he wanted to emigrate. He gathered a group, a number of families to go with him. The first ship sailed in 1818. The, the scheme itself was very successful. The families that settled out in Ontario wrote back and there were further schemes up until almost 1880. So there's a number of Protestant or a number of ans uh, descendants of those ancestors that went out. Clock Jordan, who is involved in the Ireland Reaching Out scheme, did a very nice um, 200th year commemoration back in 19 or 2018, excuse me. And uh, there's there is information on the website about that. Um, there's actually a news item about that, and I believe there's some publications and that sort of thing that you, if people are interested in pursuing, they can. And Bruce Ellis, who's a university um, professor in Carleton University, did his PhD on that, and he wrote a book about that that lists all those names. Very very interesting. It had never been looked at before, and it's, it's fascinating, really, what he um, the work that he did on that. Now um, schemes after the famine. Uh, the James Took immigrant scheme um, went from Connemara and they went to various places in the US. One of them was Boston, um, uh, Philadelphia, and I think um, there was another place as well. But anyway, this, this scheme took place in the 1870s, the late 1870s, when you had what was known as mini famines, very poor agricultural harvests, um, poor weather and people going back, the fear that they were going back into a famine situation. Now, this was particularly prevalent in Connemara, um, where the land would not be as good. And James Took was a Quaker who heard about this distress and he arranged and organized um, a scheme whereby people, uh, people came out and settled and this was paid for. Now, there is a very good blog and that's that link there that discusses that scheme. And I believe there may be a few books out about that and there may be some comm commemorations um, in, the next, in the next couple of years. So, and there's other emigrant schemes, as I mentioned earlier, Little Wexford was an assisted emigration scheme. It was a priest that essentially took his parishioners and they landed from an area in Wexford to an area in Iowa and settled there. And um, there's a number of those schemes that took place. And that's something that to keep in mind that Irish did not travel to places where they knew no one. They always went to places where they knew there were other Irish there to assist them. And there's a lot of that, a lot of that networking that went on. So the, the schemes are very, um, were very popular and there, there was an uptake of them. So I'm gonna move on now. Um, I did say, oh, I think I, I didn't, um, I didn't mention the news. I think I might have um, done the wrong thing there, did I? Oh, I think I did. Um, I had several people come to me there about New Zealand, um, and actually, what I'll do: New Zealand and um, and Argentina and South Africa. Now, I'm just going to have to do this quickly off the top of my head. New Zealand, I, I do have the I do have the links there, so so don't worry about it. New Zealand, the archives of New Zealand is very, very good for information on the emigration schemes. And and New Zealand was a popular place there in the late 1800s. Now you you had you had a, a, an Irish community in New Zealand, but many of them would have gone to Australia first and then to New Zealand. And uh, Family Search is very good for New Zealand emigration lists, and the New Zealand archives are very good for New Zealand emigration lists. Now, Family Search covers Wellington, whereas the New Zealand archives cover other ports. Okay, and um, 
the other thing to note about New Zealand emigration is that while there's not huge information or huge number of passenger lists, you can look at the newspapers, you can look at death notices and birth, marriage and death records that would give you information about where somebody emigrated from in Ireland. Okay, so that's the New Zealand side. Now the um, the Argentinian side, there's a fantastic website that I came across and I will have it for you there. I can't pronounce it there off the top of my head, but it, it's, it, it's on the source list and it lists the passengers that came out to Argentina. Now, Argentina was taking Irish emigrants from famine times and it was a place that people did go to um, because it was a Catholic country. Now, even though the culture and the language would have been different, it was Catholic. Um, there were um, there was good land out there. There are uh, several counties that are particularly noted for going to Argentina: Longford, Westmeath, and Wexford. And in addition, in the 1880s, there was a merchant class from Limerick. Not a lot of people, but a merchant class from Limerick City that also emigrated to Argentina. Now, some of that emigration in the 1880s may have been due to the land war so, because it were, they were more Protestant that went out. And of course, they bought large farms and or, you know, ran businesses. Um, the emigration really stopped uh, or became much less popular in the early 1900s as the economy in Argentina um, became much more difficult and um, it never, uh, it never uh, picked up again. And what, what actually happened was you had people that had emigrated to Argentina and either returned to Ireland or they emigrated elsewhere. They went to America, they went to Australia, they went to Canada. OK, but there is an Argent, an Irish Argentinian community in Argentina and descendants of um, of many Irish people there. And I'm trying to think, oh, South Africa, South Africa is the last one now that I forgot. To, and I'm sorry, I don't have it here on the slide. It's a different presentation. I don't know what happened to it. But anyway, the site that I would recommend for South Africa is Family Search again. And I recommend that because they do a very good job of, um, of explaining the South African, um, the emigration itself. Now there are small, there wasn't a huge amount of emigration from Ireland to South Africa. There was some. Most of that emigration was a result of the, um, the Boer War and those would have been um, men that fought in that and you know settled there, remained there. Or people that were going into civil service jobs um, we actually have a, a, a family down the road here whose ancestor joined the South African police force. He emigrated to join the police force. So it's those types of, um, those seem to be the more popular, military or civil. And there is, as I said, small communities out there. Now there's very good, um, some very good websites with graveyard inscriptions and they note where they came from. That was recently on our website, um, I think that was recently on our website in the last month or so. So it's, um, but it's family search is the, um, is the, the uh, link there. And like I said, it'll be on the source list um, to look at. And, and that's, um, that's very good as well. So I'm just about, oh yeah, boy, I'm, I've gone very, I've gone a bit over there. Now I'll take questions. So I'm going to look at, will I look at what? Will I look at the chat there? Or will you look at that? Oh yeah, wow, chat 102. Well, I won't take 102 questions, but I'll pick a couple of questions. By all means, if a question is not answered, or if you need further help or information, you can create a message board post on Ireland XO. You can put up an ancestor profile, okay? And we will reply to that ancestor profile, okay? Or you can email me directly. And in, any one of those will work. So, Jane, I might yes. actually help you with um, a, a lot of questions are coming in about military archives. So, people who would have joined the British or other militaries, and what would you recommend um, for researching those? Okay. 
if you have a military person, what I would recommend that maybe went off to South Africa, normally those would have been, those are British records. Now, um, let me say this about those. The, the place to look for them, um, now you, there, you can look for them on, on the subscription websites, but you can also look for them on the National Archives in England, which is known as Q. Now, I will include that. I was thinking about that earlier. At the moment, Q is closed um, because of the pandemic. Now, when Q closed in March, they uploaded a lot of their digital collections onto the website so people could access them. And they are really, really good. They're worth looking at. There's a lot of military information there. Um, it's free. You have to register for the site, and I will send the link along with that. Um, I'm just writing it down here. You, free to register, and what you can do then, once you go into it and you join, you can look through and you can download. Okay. Now, you won't be able to download every document of the online collections, but they tell you what's downloadable and what's not downloadable. Now, my advice to you is whatever is downloadable that looks interesting, I would definitely download because it may not be free in six months time, okay? So it's well worth doing that. Um, I spent an afternoon recently doing that. Um, do I have a, uh, so that's that's the key thing there. Family search is very good good now for military. Family search is really a catch-all. The only thing about family search is that you may find you have to do more digging and looking through records um, with family search than it popping out at you in um, Ancestry. Okay. Now, um, uh, June, uh, you, can, um, you can get the handout in the next couple of days. That'll be sent to you. Okay. Everybody will get the handout. Nobody will be left behind on that. Okay. Um, now, anybody else uh, who are, how do I research ancestors who were active in the revolution of 1916? I assume you're talking about the Irish revolution. Um, you can act, that's the Bureau of Military Archives. So I'll add that onto the list. That's a very interesting one. We'd love to see an ancestor profile. If you have it, um, I would encourage you because that's a great way to not only share the information, but it jogs people um, or spurs people to add information to that. And it can be very, very helpful to you to have an ancestor profile up with that information. Um, now, good, that's great. Um, Irish residents are doing DNA tests, uh, so everybody's doing DNA tests this day. Uh, where can I view records of births in Ireland before 1830? Roots Ireland, which is a subscription site, or you can, if you know where they came from, you can look through the parish registers on the National Library of Ireland website. The, the, a lot of the Catholic parish registers are online there. Um, any more... Um, any newspapers? Yeah, uh, the Boston Pilot is the newspaper in America. That's the free newspaper. It's available through, I think it's Villanova. Oh no, it's, I'm sorry, I think it's Boston College. But if you Google Boston Pilot, it'll come up and that does the missing friends. Um, and in Peru, that's great. The per I, I'd like to, yeah, we're a great deal of British immigrants of directs arrived here around 1830. Okay, and that's, that's very interesting that we, we'd love to hear from you, Rosario, if you have a profile um, that you share with a, for a, with a couple of ancestors, because that South America is very interesting. And there was, there was um, immigration there um, and, and people that did settle there. So we would love to hear from you. Um, and Missing Friends is great. It's Boston College. Thanks, Jeannie. Yeah. Um, Rosa. Oh, Rosa. So there's another person from Lima, Peru. Oh, that's great. Well, listen, for the, for the people from Peru, please consider putting on an ancestor profile because that would be really, we would love to hear from you. Um, we do have a, Laura was saying now we do have an insight or um, an email going out about the Irish in Argentina, and we'd love to have another email going out in the future about the Irish in Peru. So by all means, let us know about the Irish-Peruvian connection. 
Um, oh, and Rose is your cousin. So your cousin. So you're meeting on Zoom this evening in Peru. And it's great to meet you. Um, now, um, the ports that, that, that somebody's asking me about the ports, that's where the ships list is really good because there were numerous ports, particularly during the famine. It wasn't just uh, Queens or Cove, Queenstown or Cove or Dublin. They were going from Kilrush, they were going from Limerick, they were going from Galway, they were going from in Vara, they were going from Westport. So, and, and the ships list have a number of those, um, those ship lists from a variety of ports. Now, two things I did mention, there was a very good, there's two very good lists for um, ports from Northern Ireland, ships lines from Northern Ireland. One is J.J. Cook, and the other one is the, um, and I was McCorkle, McCorkle line, and those London Derry, or Derry was known as the Ellis Island of the North. So uh, those are free to search, and I will um, I will put those links as well. I do have those links as well to put into the um, put into the handout. So it's great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your um, your time. It's nine forty five here, so I'm sure that um, you're you probably had enough of me. Forty five minutes is probably enough. Like I said, any questions, email me. Um, if you want to post a message board post, by all means do add an ancestor profile, keep engaging with us so we can engage back with you and connect you with, um, with your ancestral parish and with locals um, in the parish, because that's really what we're all about is engaging and reconnecting. So um, it was great, great to hear you are, are great to, not maybe great to hear me, maybe not, I'm sick of hearing me, but great to see you all. And um, everybody have a lovely afternoon or evening um, or, or day for those of you that may have gotten up very early to watch this. So thanks very much, everybody. Great to see you. And we'll see you next time, um, hopefully with census information. Okay, bye-bye for now.